here in West Medford in 1871, a few years after the Civil War. During my life, I was always busy. Busy trying to accomplish everything that I needed to do in the few hours that we call every day. The years passed too quickly. There never seemed to be enough time to gather friends together, just to enjoy being alive. Right now, we have been given a rare opportunity. I have turned back the calendar to read 1967. Then I was in my, 19, in my 90s, still eager to be part of everything going on. During my long life, I witnessed many changes in my extended family, some of whom were nationally known heroes. I spent several years in a culture far removed from my Massachusetts home. There were difficulties, but also opportunities. Sadness that led to great joy, Questions followed by, at times, satisfactory answers. My life, as you say today, was awesome. One of the reasons for my visit is to give you a gift. You will experience the beauty of some ancient songs called spirituals. Listen, please, with attentive ears. You will be very pleased, I promise. There will be three of us speaking to you today. My younger self, We'll talk about my early years, when I was filled with hope. What adventures came my way? My comments will shed light on my later years, until I went into eternity in 1967. I always loved the challenge of going in a new direction. I have asked this moderator to describe my background and the neighborhood. She will keep things in order. Her job is to anchor us in the right time and place. Let me set the stage, and you know how I like to do that. American elms flourished along the sides of West Medford's dirt roads in the late 1860s. Many of these young trees had been set out by Edmund T. Hastings, a major landowner in this part of town. The area was not yet a neighborhood. There were, of course, the extensive lands of the Brooks Estates that extended from the Mystic Lakes over to Oak Grove Cemetery and as far as Winchester. High Street, the old way to Arlington, served as the main thoroughfare. Not many houses dotted the landscape, but there was a sense of change coming because everyone was ready for good things to happen. After the life-altering ordeal of the Civil War, the area attracted new families. These people required access to the city, but also wanted the pleasures of country living. Many of the graceful branches of Mr. Hastings' elms grew into organic arches over High Street. The trees became mute witnesses to an increasing number of wagons, travelers on horseback, and new residents who commuted by train to Boston. By 1868, there was activity in a large tract, almost picture it, 200 acres, that had been owned by Edmund T. Hastings and his partner, Samuel Teal, Jr. Divided into generous house lots, the land was a great location 
for quality residences. A network of streets such as Auburn and Alston defined the property. Mystic Street, a focus of this presentation, descended from a hilltop, went over High Street, and then down into the river. Historian Charles Brooks described the Hastings real estate venture as beginning in, could you believe, a spirit of speculation, <laughs> but ending up as a benefit for the entire community. And now the players. Morris Hallowell and his wife Hannah were people of privilege who also happened to be Quakers, abolitionists, and the parents of eight children. <laughs> Living quite comfortably in Philadelphia of the 1830s, Morris operated a highly successful silk and china goods import business. He developed a steamship line in the 1850s to facilitate trade with the South. Because he was an outspoken opponent of slavery, his Southern customers lashed out at him threatening to cut off their lucrative dealings with this firm. Morris stated quite forcefully, hey, that's Morris from beyond. <laughs> I sell goods, not principles. That did it. That was the end of his business. Soon the Southerners were boycotting his company. They were completely outraged when they discovered that the Hallowell home in Philadelphia was a stop on the Underground Railroad. <clears throat> the coming of the Civil War in 1861 struck his enterprise such a fatal blow that he was forced to liquidate his business. Three of the Hallowell sons, Richard, Edward, and Norwood, became ardent abolitionists who eventually found their home here in West Medford. Young Richard Hallowell, born 1835, relocated here first. In support of emancipation, he joined forces with Major George Luther Stearns, a wealthy South Medford merchant. By 1863, they were making a concerted effort to recruit free blacks to serve in the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Vivid recruiting pro posters urged free black men to enlist, fueling local debates that the black men would be useless in fighting a white man's war. A lot of black. Sturridge and Hallowell prevailed and continued on the long journey towards racial equality. The other Hallowell brothers, Norwood, born 1839, and his older brother Edward, born 1836, chose to serve in the military. That was risky. They volunteered to fight because the injustice of slavery had burned into their very souls. During July of 1861, both were commissioned as officers in the 20th Regiment. They almost immediately saw action in the early battles of Ball's Bluff and the Battle of the Peninsula. On September 17, 1862, the bloody Battle of Antietam in Maryland resulted in the almost fatal wounding, wounding of Captain Norwood. A bullet had shattered the bone in his left arm, causing him to fall to the ground where he was left for dead. There was no ambulance service at the time. Edward, the night after the battle, spent hours wandering over the field and checking the faces of the dead in hopes of finding his brother. It was a relief to learn that Norwood managed to stumble through the rebel ranks and then find refuge in a nearby house. A surgeon saved the arm but it remained about 50% useful during the rest of Norwood's life, causing him great aggravation. 
The Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 set in motion the drive to recruit black soldiers. This effort, as you have heard, was the particular goal of Richard Hallowell. Robert Gould Shaw was commissioned colonel of the 54th. Norwood was to serve as first lieutenant, but his unhealed wound forced him to withdraw. His next appointment involved the recruitment and training of a second black regiment, the 55th, of which he became colonel. Edward was commissioned lieutenant colonel in Norwood's place. On July 18, 1863, the 54th Regiment's assault on Fort Wagner near Charleston, South Carolina, resulted in the death of Colonel Shaw and 272 of his black troops. Edward Hallowell was wounded after he had reached the parapet. Rolling into a ditch, he was hit again. He crawled with great difficulty to the Union lines, where he collapsed. The fort was not captured, despite the bravery of the Union forces. After Edward had recovered from his wounds, he returned as colonel to take command of the 54th. Fighting and bloodshed continued until the surrender of Confederate General Robert E. Lee at Appomattox in 1865. The official end would come many months later. The Hallowell brothers were absolutely determined to put their lives on track again. Norwood married his sweetheart, Sarah Hayek, in 1867. Edward, now a brigadier general, exchanged vows with Charlotte W. Sweat in 1869. Then came the move to West Medford at the invitation of Richard Hallowell and his wife, Anna Coffin Davis, who were living in an attractive brick house on the corner of Auburn and High Street. The house no longer exists. Since it was the late 1860s, and land in West Medford was still a bargain, picture that, Richard had purchased some extensive lots adjacent to Mystic Street. Norwood and Edward were very eager to live close by. They quickly bought the empty land next to their prosperous brother. Much of Mystic Street then became informally known as Hallowell Country. May I now introduce young Emily Hallowell, Edward's daughter. my parents settled into West Medford, not far from where my two uncles, Richard and Norwood, were already starting to raise their families. Just newlyweds, my parents found temporary lodging in the Pierpont House on Upper Mystic Street. Reverend John Pierpont, the first owner since 1846, had been a staunch abolitionist as well as a Unitarian minister. His death in 1866, at the age of 81, was greatly lamented by all of us. James, his son, you may remember, composed the famous slaying song, Jingle Bells. It was common knowledge in the neighborhood that James and his father had a strained relationship, to say the least. Perhaps that was the reason that the house became available to my parents. It was there my sister named Lottie for our mother Charlotte was born in January of 1870. My own birth followed the next year. At the beginning of June 1871, I took my first breath in the tree-filled neighborhood of Upper Mystic Street. My mother gave thanks that I was a completely healthy baby with a robust set of lungs, but her joy was severely tempered when she thought about my father, her beloved Edward, who lay terminally ill in the next room to mine. Subject to violent chills and burning fevers, he had contracted malaria while serving in the Union Army. One of his friends who visited him during his last illness wrote about my father that 
he had taken up the sword because of his cherished principles and in behalf of an enslaved race. When the victory for the right was won, he gladly became a civilian again with an unsullied record of deeds. He was slowly wasting away, and so he lingered on for a few more weeks after my birth, his health declining rapidly in sharp contrast to my happy progress. On July 26, he breathed his last, surrounded by family and friends. Someone, I don't recall the source, said that he was as much a ca casualty of the war as if he had been killed on the battlefield. But his death is not the point of my story. I have lived surrounded by love. My remarkable extended family never pitied me or showered me with favors because I was fatherless. I was expected to run errands, do my share of the housework, and help look after my younger cousins. All of the Medford Hallowells were independent souls who followed their own stars, but we were steeped in the concept of dedication to family and the community. During the months in this house, my parents had gone on to purchase land and were building a new home on Lower Mystic Street next to my Uncle Norwood's property. My father's untimely death immediately caused my mother to adjust her plans. Moving down the street became her next priority. She was especially grateful for the extra financial support that the brothers quietly provided. Our household budget was trimmed to cover essentials, but we never felt deprived because Mother was extremely clever. Over time, I was nicknamed Millie. Here in the open yards and gardens of Mystic Street, my family, consisting of two babies and my mother, was warmly embraced by an exuberant, sometimes rowdy, group of relatives. As time passed, each household owned its own horses and a pony or two. Besides furnishing us with a means of getting from place to place, the animals were our beloved pets. Each household employed at least one female domestic servant who helped with the housework and cleaning. A few of the maids were given their own quarters upstairs. Keeping the houses repaired and the grounds in order fell to the lot of several men who lived nearby. Gradually, Uncle Norwood and his wife Sarah added six children to their family circle, which meant that my days of quiet reflection were interrupted by the adventures of my unstoppable cousins. I liked to spend afternoons in my bedroom, lost in a book, while Lottie was more active. Her talent was carving wooden figures or elaborate picture frames. Then would come the knock on the door, which meant one or more of the cousins would be insist that we go out and get some fresh air. And we would hike over to the beautiful Brooks estate because Aunt Sarah, a close friend of Mrs. Brooks, had been given permission for us to explore the woods, ride, horsebook, or, ho ride horseback, or skate on the ponds. I remember Uncle Norwood's surprising acknowledgement of each of his six children's birth. He constructed an addition, an addition to his house each year that a son or daughter was born. I admired his enthusiasm, but have to say that he created an architectural monstrosity. And strangers would often ring the doorbell inquiring about renting a room in what they thought was a hotel. For several years, my Aunt Sarah quietly held Quaker meetings in her front parlor. She read passages from the Bible and insisted that one or more of my cousins recite poetry. Other friends and relatives participated, though I could never bring myself to attend because religion had been a private matter to me. The closeness of our households, meaning my uncle's brood on Auburn Street and Norwood's brood next to us, led everyone to call our united families the colony. We loved being part of this energetic assembly. My own participation was often understated, as was my nature. On warm summer nights, I would wander over to Uncle Norwood's when it was quiet before bedtime, and I would sing one or two songs that would relax the younger children, and my Aunt Sarah said it was the perfect ending to a busy day. There were moments when I needed to take a break and walk by myself along the shores of the Mystic River. Oh. One of my dearest friends, my cousin Susan, was very perceptive. She told me that she could often see a kind of sadness pass over my face, and she was right. Those moments were the times that I was thinking about my father, Edward, whom I never knew. People told me that my education was very casual. My mother had decided that she could do a better job than any private or school town, town school. In her defense, it was at a time when educating girls was not a priority for many families, 
given that she was gifted in reading aloud and explaining the book's meaning. She opted to homeschool both Lottie and me. Other cousins, boys and girls went on to colleges and art school, but I did not feel that I was being deprived. I loved the classics, and I would go on to join Medford's Shakespeare Club. Music and singing became my particular passions. My mother and my aunts encouraged me to perform at fa fa family gatherings, which gave me the confidence as an adult to join the Boston Symphony Orchestra Chorus. I never anticipated that these gifts would become my life's work. My life in Medford as a young woman centered around private teaching and joining improvement societies. In my spare time, I continued reading the classics and everything was satisfactory. Yet I felt a constant ache that something was lacking. Then, in 1892, my dear friend Charlotte Thorne offered me an opportunity that I could not refuse. <laughs> but, I am getting ahead of myself. I have to tell you about Charlotte and her mission. Charlotte Thorne, born in 1857 in Connecticut, was more than a decade older than I was. Not only blessed with beauty and a keen mind, in the sense of how to take care of crying children. <laughs> Not only blessed with beauty and a keen mind, she also has the privilege of growing up in an upper-class family. Sometimes I thought that her most difficult decision each day was whether to play cards or be taken for a carriage ride. Oh, Charlotte. But deep down, there was a strong civic-minded part in her personality that underscored her interest in social justice. And she did. She surprised everyone in 1880s by becoming an instructor at the Hampton Institute in Virginia. This historically black college was founded after the Civil War in order to offer education to the newly freed slaves. One of Hampton's most famous graduates was Booker T. Washington, the founder of Tuskegee University. In 1891, he was passionate about establishing a school in one of the rural sections of Alabama. His target was Calhoun, which was 28 miles west of Montgomery. This scattered settlement of 2,700 African Americans and 100 whites sustained an agricultural community where African American tenant farmers worked the rich, dark soil that was owned by a handful of white landlords. Access to the Louisville and Nashville Railroad ensured that crops would be, could be transported to the market quickly. When Washington visited Calhoun in 1891 at the invitation of the black residents, he met with many of the farmers. Some had walked 10 miles to ask for his professional help. To emphasize their commitment, they contributed together over $500 as a down payment towards the construction of the school building. Within a year, Washington and other benefactors had raised enough funds to purchase 90 acres of land. Uh, another local donor contributed 10 acres to bring 100 acres that would become a combined farm with the school campus. Charlotte Thorne, my friend, quickly joined Washington's team. She and her assistant, Mabel Dillingham, deserve the credit for being the founding teachers of the Calhoun, what we then call colored school. It was a brave move but social conditions in Alabama made the undertaking perilous. Given the fact that the farmers were still traumatized by the impacts of slavery and the white landowners were suspicious of any progress, the environment was unquestionably uncertain. I was overwhelmed when Charlotte challenged me to join her daring enterprise. My girlhood spent in the safety of Mystic Street had done little to prepare me for this uncharted way of life in a new environment. Suddenly, I sensed that my father was reaching out to me. For years, I had yearned to carry on his legacy of fighting for social justice. Yet, my status as a single woman in the 19th century seemed to limit my possibilities. Despite my trepidations, however, I was confident that Calhoun would fulfill my dream of service. I counted on family support, and I got it. In true Hallowell style, my mother, sister, two uncles, and the brood of cousins sent me off with books, clothing, and enough suggestions to last a lifetime. I arrived in Alabama in 1892, anxious to begin teaching. Immediately, I was thrust into an unknown world. The center of town featured a small cluster of buildings that were completely different from the suburban landscape of West Medford. 
where I grew up. There was nothing familiar for me to cling to. I was relieved to meet up with my friend Charlotte, who gave me extensive briefing on what to expect from life in the Deep South. She pointed out the improvements that had been introduced in the few months since the Calhoun School had become a real presence in the community. The clean but simple building in which the school had been incorporated had been set off by an irregular fence defining the yard. Another schoolhouse was being constructed that would contain traditional classrooms equipped with desks and blackboards. Female teachers found adequate lodgings in a decent structure close to the school. However, male teachers had to adjust to cramped quarters in a cabin while their own dorm was under construction. It would be ready within weeks. Many students were able to walk to class, however, some lived too far away, and the immediate solution involved boarding some pupils along with their teacher in a church that was also almost a mile away from campus. Other needs became apparent. During the next two years, we were compelled to erect a barn to shelter the mules and cow that had been donated. As enrollment escalated to more than 300 boys and girls, we built new cottages for boarders, an annex for three new teachers, and an industrial building that would accommodate carpentry classes for the boys and cooking classes for the girls. The Calhoun School soon embraced a kindergarten. This venture amazed everyone, especially the white landlords who were doubtful that their tenant farmers would even consider educating such young children. It was certainly acceptable and necessary, may I add, that the older boys spent a day a week maintaining the farm while the girls did their share by working in the laundry. Sewing classes trained them to mend everyone's clothing as well as teach them marketable skills. And the object of these lessons in agriculture and domestic service was to empower the young adults. A hope was that they would remain in the community rather than rush to the city to make a living. Early in the history of the school, a land company was formed to enable the black farmers, all of whom had been tenants, to buy land for themselves. And this was one of the most strategic moves negotiated by the Calhoun leaders. And here's how it worked. The school purchased large tracts of available land near its own area. Then it would offer small, smaller parcels at a reasonable price to the tenant farmers, some of whom were already living there and working. Less than $300 would buy a farm of 40 acres and a mule. Sharecroppers suddenly became landowners. Each and every owner suddenly was self -reliant member of, uh, was a self-reliant member of the community, and within three years there were 80 independent families living in close proximity to the school. Their standard of living had been changed, and land ownership became the key to independence. One-room cabins into which large, fam large families had once lived were replaced with neat little cottages of two to five rooms. The local residents were feeling more comfortable about their place in the community, and families would gather in front of their new home to pose. Many of the adults would go on to attend night school at, at our community, where they learned how to read, write, and do sums. Then another series of courses were introduced where the newly literate population had the opportunity to gain instruction from the industrial teachers. My own role in the school had flexible boundaries. My academic responsibilities centered around teaching music. And here I felt completely at home because singing and voice lessons had filled much of my time in Medford. Community outreach was my second, very open-ended duty. Meeting the parents of some of the students necessitated traveling on narrow dirt roads to the most remote areas of the Calhoun Township. Charlotte Thorne supplied me with a charming donkey on which to make my rounds, and he reminded me so much of the ponies back in Medford. Because I loved animals, I bonded with my extraordinary mode of transportation, and I'm firmly convinced that his presence helped me to uh, uh, access some of the more reclusive residents I encountered. Besides reassuring the parents that continuing to educate their children would pay dividends now and in the future, I urged the parents to take part in other programs, such as farmers' conferences, mothers' meetings, and com community planning sessions. And the school became a center to all the life in the surrounding neighborhood. And then came the most life-changing event for me, thanks to this community. In the evening, after a family had gracio graciously shared their community with me, they joined together in singing their ancient songs 
composed under the bonds of slavery, which had been for generations a stimulus to courage and a tie to heaven. Other people came from nearby houses, and soon there would be an extraordinary blend of voices. These melodies, spirituals, were so different in rhythm and spirit from anything I had ever heard. They expressed the feelings of triumph, trust, and loss, centered on what it meant to be a Christian and enslaved. A few of the songs were familiar to me because I had heard the students singing them during their free time. Over the weeks and months, I was able to lend my own voice to these gatherings, and I felt blessed. The spirituals had become a part of my own inner life, thanks to the Calhoun community. Between the end of young Emily and the start of mature Emily, there's some things to say. Because of her frequent visits to the isolated farms connected with the school, Emily convinced a number of families that Calhoun was the natural center for their community life. The possibility of owning their own land and homes had become a reachable goal for black farmers long used to working for a landlord. As the 1890s unfolded, more and more children were enrolled in the practical, hands-on courses offered by the seven white teachers from the North and four black teachers from Hampton, Hampton Institute. Six other workers brought the teaching faculty to a total of 17 dedicated men and women. The special songs sung by the students and their families continue to inspire this young woman from Medford. She soon realized that the melodies deserved to be shared by everyone. She started to shape these unique pieces into a collection, but this was time-consuming work, and there were immediate tasks before her. Her busy life at Calhoun quickly absorbed two years, then another five years, with the certainty that there was always so much more to accomplish. At the dawn of the new century, in the spring of 1900, a hastily written letter arrived from the North. It changed absolutely everything for her. But the other Emily will tell you about this. just completed another class in music, a time when I thoroughly enjoyed listening to the complex harmonies that my students could weave together. This was my typical day. Then there came a quick rap on the door, and an older student, somewhat out of breath, announced that Miss Thorne wanted to see me immediately. I hurried to her office where she handed me an envelope from home. What was wrong? Tearing it open, I discovered that Lottie, my older sister, was seriously ill. My mother's terse paragraph avoided details. She wrote, I don't know how much time Lottie has left. She cannot seem to overcome the fever and sickness that have consumed her for two weeks. No further explanation. Shocked and more than a little puzzled, I wondered if there was more to the story. I had to return to West Medford as quickly as possible. My colleagues, bless them, took care of all my duties, plus my outreach visits to the community. The trip back north filled me with foreboding. When I walked from the local train station and turned down Mystic Street, I was astonished to find that our house had disappeared. An orchard of young apple trees now grew where our dining room used to be. Cousin Susan came running from next door to fill me in. Mother had evidently tired of, and I quote, all the noise made by Norwood's family of six children and their friends. She wanted more peace and quiet. Quite unexpectedly, she had relocated our house across the street. It was tucked into the farthest corner of a lot owned by my Uncle Richard. She named the house Opposite. 
as a candid comment on her state of mind. This was all news to me. As I hurried down our new walk, lined with wisteria transplanted from the old garden, my sister flung open the door to meet me. She admitted that she had been confined to bed for almost three weeks, but now she was completely well. Lottie did not realize that I had been summoned. Lottie's illness must have overwhelmed Mother, perhaps even stirring up a few dark flashbacks of my father's last sickness. Her world would have collapsed if my sister had died and I were out of reach in Alabama. My sister suggested that I take a leave of absence. Had I misjudged the situation at home? Mother, a firm supporter of women's suffrage and other progressive causes, had always been far too independent to surrender to negative emotions. And then I recalled my own melancholy walks along the Mystic River. It was important to be with family. And I also knew that I had to stay connected to Calhoun. To reach this new goal meant publishing the spirituals that had influenced me so much and that I had compiled. I was now even more convinced that their beauty and charm must be shared by everyone. In early 1901, I approached a small Boston firm, C.W. Thompson Company, with the concept of publishing what I called back then the plantation songs. Mr. Thompson was intrigued, even suggesting to print them as economically as possible since I wanted to market the volume as a fundraiser. It worked. Brushing off the dust from my family's list of social connections, I performed the plantation songs at many Beacon Hill tea parties. Thankfully, my voice lessons provided me with the professional training necessary to capture the attention of these influential women. The first edition of the songs sold rapidly. I want to take a moment to mention to you that my extended family continued to support the Calhoun School. Uncle Richard volunteered his services as auditor. His daughter, my cousin May, founded the Calhoun Club, a group of her friends who sponsored fairs at Trinity Church and other houses of worship. All the proceeds furnished funds needed to expand academic and vocational programs. Members of Uncle Norwood's family consistently donated money, as did my mother and sister. It became the center of all of our lives. And the years just kept moving forward at such a pace that I could not believe it was suddenly 1913. And I was almost 42. The Calhoun campus was thriving. We tapped into a natural supply of underground water that provided everyone with access to this precious commodity. Our crops were flourishing. Because I was now in charge of community outreach, I met people in their homes every day. The sight of a healthy grandmother attending to her wonderful baby grandson, the appearance of beautifully dressed students heading off to gymnastics class, and confident groups of graduates posing for their photos, all these moments became treasured memories. During some lean years of the early 1920s, when I served as vice principal, we stretched our resources almost to the breaking point in order to keep our clients clothed and in school. My friends at the Arlington Street Church in Boston sent us many donations of gently used outfits, as well as essential household items. I will never forget standing on the stairs of the main office, surrounded by parents, one father took me aside to quietly say, I don't know how the people could have lived through this hard year without the chance to buy good clothes for a little bit of money. We charged a nominal fee because we respected everyone's independence. It was especially gratifying when a ship shipment of shoes arrived, as many of our students did not have footwear for graduation day. I wanted to work at Calhoun forever, but that proved impractical. During the summer of 1928, Lottie and I had the great good fortune to visit Lisbon, Portugal for a few days. This was one of many trips abroad that I enjoyed over the course of my long life. I was a robust 57, but quite fatigued. When, when we docked in New York, she had convinced me that I needed to start a new chapter. When I permanently returned to Mystic Street, it was the late 1920s. My dear mother had passed away in 1919, leaving just the two of us 
Lottie and me, to be the only residents of the house named opposite. Everything was in place, including my new job as a freelance typist, and I was feeling restless. My sister suggested that we learn to drive an automobile because she had noticed that there were very few horses and buggies left in the neighborhood. I agreed immediately. We took a week off to practice maneuvering a friend's motor car, and the lessons went remarkably well, if I do say so. Everyone knows that the Hollowells are not very mechanical by nature, and we were no exception to that rule. Despite some confusion in putting the vehicle into reverse, I felt ready to experience the freedom of the open road. Our next step was to buy an auto and then plan a trip. We shopped in Medford's Salem Street automobile showroom. Driving home in our own sedan was very satisfying, especially when all the neighbors came over to check out our new Ford. Then came the more difficult part of revealing our idea to drive cross country to California. Winter weather was closing in on us. Thoroughly pessimistic, our, our cousins directed all sorts of warnings our way, but we were unstoppable. Didn't they realize that we had been behind a steering wheel for over three weeks? <laughs> the men of the family, especially Uncle Norwood's son, reviewed, refused to give their permission. Permission. Perhaps they had forgotten my independent years at Calhoun. Not to worry, we set out before Christmas. Finding a safe route over the mountains was the hardest part, but we never, and I mean never, had an accident. When my dear companion and sister Lottie passed away in May 1943, I tried to be resigned, but was completely heartbroken. Her gentle personality had been my constant support from early childhood on. Lottie was the unflappable center of our domestic universe. Her charming studio still anchors the corner of our house lot. This was her special place where she created carved wood frames painted with gold leaf. Many of her friends were delighted to receive samples of her handiwork. They loved her elegant doors, panels, and wooden chairs. I recall that Lottie's art high, was highlighted in a Boston Globe article in 1912, when she and other artists were featured in a Boylston Street art gallery. To be recognized by the Boston art community was an enormous achievement. It was time again to make substantial changes. The old wooden house built by, built, built by my parents in 1870 was no longer serviceable. There were major structural repairs that demanded attention, and I was tired of hearing complaints from the coal delivery man and other tradespeople that the distance from the sidewalk to the front door was much too far. Since I was only in my mid-80s, I decided to check out some nearby apartments for rent. There was nothing satisfactory nor affordable, so the most practical solution was to tear down my decaying home and build something up-to-date, modern, was the word for the 1950s. My cousin Bob was horrified when he heard that not only was I going contemporary, but also that I had hired James Lawrence Jr., a fabulous Boston architect, to design my dream home. I have to smile when I recall his protestations that Mr. Lawrence would go way over budget, add details that I didn't need, and most of all, build something that was not traditional. I was determined to own a 20th century home filled with light from the outdoors. My special concern focused on a magnificent oak tree that had protected the backyard for well over a century. I was delighted that the architect's plans featured a living room, bedrooms, and even an entrance hall that looked out on that ancient oak. Despite its modest size, the house avoided a feeling of confinement. The low roof with its deep overhangs gave me a sense of privacy, but not isolation. Even Cousin Bob came round to my way of thinking. I loved every inch of that house. There is a saying that age is only a number, and I have tried to embrace that concept because getting older should not mean rejecting new experiences. In the 1960s, it was necessary for me to make some decisions. 
People were constantly reminding me that I had reached the ninth decade of my life. They meant well, but the frequent admonitions to be careful, watch your step, they made me nervous. Life had much to offer. Some things had changed. I no longer drove my car, but I discovered that the local bus route supplied such a reasonable number of trips to and from Boston that I could regularly attend afternoon performances at the symphony. I was occasionally disgruntled with the bus service, yet was quick to remind my neighbors that the Metropolitan Transit Authority got passengers to their destination, quote, with a fair degree of efficiency and in reasonable comfort. Perhaps you read my letter in support of public transportation that was printed in the Boston Globe. I never registered as a Democrat or a Republican because I was suspicious of both parties. Voting as an independent allowed me to be true to my beliefs. I vowed never to forget the struggle that women had endured in order to gain the right to cast a ballot. To this day, I do not trust most politicians. It was true that my formal education was unorthodox. My travels with my sister in Europe and this country, however, gave me a broad understanding of the diversity of human nature. I knew that reading, attending lectures, and being open to new ideas would help me remain up to date in literature, art, and music. And mother had made sure that I was on good speaking terms with the classics. And then there was my beloved Calhoun School. My years teaching there were driven by my father's passion for racial equality, which then became my passion. Long after the school closed in 1945, I remained in close contact with former students and teachers. Who could have predicted that Alabama would educate me so completely? I am delighted that the spirituals will, today, be reaching a new audience. I have tried to write them just as they are sung, retaining all the details and peculiarities of rhythm, melody, harmony, and text. But it is impossible to more than suggest their beauty and charm. The volume sold well, and three editions were printed. Today it is a great joy to introduce the songs to this gathering of modern men and women from Medford and other communities. My story is almost complete, but I have one more important observation to make. I would like my younger self to step forward. <coughs> wow. Thank you, younger self, for recounting our experiences from the past. You have dusted off memories and given them new life. I also know that your outer confidence sometimes hid moments of serious self-doubt. I am here to promise you that you will have many new adventures. You will rely on the good advice of family and friends who will encourage you to reach your potential. Your life will have meaning. Your life will have meaning. Are you ready to take the risk to be your father's daughter? I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> There's a copy of the plantation songs that the library, under swearing everything I do, <laughs> allowed me to remove from its archives. Made sure that it was printed on the cheap. So, Mr. Tompkins, the uh, editor and pu the publisher, made sure to do it out of decent paper, but nothing glossy, fancy, no illustrations, nothing that would attract Beacon Hill. Emily said these songs can stand on their own. We need to hear them. We need to hear the depths to which they called the fact that these were songs coming from the hearts of, at one point, enslaved people, the songs that gave them hope and trust. And now I want to be sure to bring them to a whole different audience, especially for us in the North, 
who had never heard anything really like this. We are greatly privileged today. You all know Stacy Clayton, what a great voice she is. And so what we have to give you a sheer joy is that Stacy will be singing some of the songs from the Plantation book. So without further ado, let's enjoy Stacy. Thank you. And I'm so grateful to you, Dee, for introducing me to her and to learn more today about how incredible she was and how much of an advocate she was to give rights, civil rights to all of um, you know, the black community that she um, encountered, she lived with, she experienced, and she loved. Um, I, I really am very, very happy to learn about her. Um, and also I want to introduce you to Jenny, who uh, hails from Sweden. I think some of you might have seen her, she's sung with us before, but it's really interesting that you're the one that's helping me because this is Miss Justice over here, I can call her. <laughs> she belongs to more organizations than I could even think of, even more than I am. So I'm very grateful, Jenny, that you um, are accompanying me and helping me to share to this next generation the songs that um, I've now been learning uh, from uh, Emily. I'm just interested to see how many of you think that you know uh, like maybe five songs that she she <laughs> sent here to Medford. All right, maybe one? Maybe one. Yep, yep. Uh, how about three? All right, so we thought we knew about three of the longest of songs in that book. I came here today and I was um, given a chance to touch the book that she touched and left at the library. And I saw that the amazing grace that we thought was the amazing grace, it's a completely different amazing grace. So um, I'm gonna do a combination of things today. I took a little bit of a license to, um, uh, we, we are trying to, do the songs as closely to what is written as possible, but there are some southern words that I could not do much justice with, so I just decided to sing it as I could, kind of thing, instead of trying to do the southern southern uh, words because I just would not do it well. Um, but I am telling you that you at least know one or two songs, and the first one I decided to make a song that's very familiar. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Feel free to enjoy the spirit of the music, to sing as you feel, because that's how the slaves sang. As they were working, it made the time pass much more easily if they could work and sing together and feel that sense of community as they were singing.
see my elder coming, coming, coming. I see my elder coming, making for the promised land. that they were so close to that promise that that's what kept them hoping. Meanwhile, we're so far removed from slavery that we're afraid to die. But these people were looking forward to making it to the promised land. That was their hope. And every single chip they chipped, every single hold they hold, everything that they did, it was with this purpose in mind, to make it to the promised land. You know, it is our promise just the same, but we're just not as close to it. You know, it's sometimes I think um, we, we don't remember that this is not all that there is. That there's something that's promised to us that's even better than what we've got. So we don't have to fear death as much as we really do. Thank you very much. This one was ama Amazing Grace is another piece that... Uh, uh, she brought back for us to, to be able to enjoy. Well, it was a surprise to the both of us to hear that it wasn't the same Amazing Grace. I wonder, is it at all possible that you would allow us to actually see that Amazing Grace again? I'm going to ask Jenny if she could just play in the book and just play what the tune actually sounded like because, of course, uh, we know the derivative of that, um, you know, our version of it, but it would be nice to just honor her by uh, listening to what it sounded like. Now, I'm not a trained musician, so I'm going to try and sight read along, so it won't sound like it's supposed to, but if I can, I will. God-given gift to sing and stuff. Jenny might have gotten a little bit more like piano lessons when she was younger, but we both sing and uh, and she plays by ear. Um, so it was really brave of you to try that, Jenny. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
So I am sure over the years there have been many reasons why we've, and, um, you know, we've, the, the lyrics have continued and the, and the tune has changed. Mm -hmm. um, but I would love it if you would join me in singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And I deem it a personal challenge to now um, get a copy of this book so that, you know, for the concerts that we usually do, I can actually infuse some of those songs so we can continue to have that generated um, from generation to generation. I'm really pretty excited.
right, now. So we have one of our songs to teach you. All right, so uh, I'm not going to even teach you in parts. All right, so you're going to have to learn to sing by ear, too. Uh, this is one that I actually found on YouTube. One of, I couldn't find very much on YouTube for, of all her older songs. Um, it's called, I Know the Lord Has Laid His Hands on Me. Has anybody ever heard that one before? Oh, you have. Good. Come here. I'm going to try. Been a long time. Oh, so Hands 
saw me. Okay, with the both of them. I know the Lord. I, no, sorry. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. One, two, three, four, five. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. the soprano. One, two, three, four, five. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. One more time. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Okay, now, this is the men's part. After we sing that part, the words are, I went to the valley and I didn't go to sit, to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. Well, you might have to do it an octave. I'm trying to turn in your voice. Uh, who can sing tenor? Sing it the octave. Come. Yeah. I went to the... Okay, I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. Ready? One, two, three, four. I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. Good. I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. So you're right after the women are done. Okay, let's do that again, men. One, two, three, four. I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. Uh, one more time. One, two, three, four. I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. All right, good. So we have all the parts now. I know the Lord. I know the Lord, I know the Lord. Ready? One, two, three, four. I know the Lord, I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. One more time. I know the Lord, I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I because it's not going to be on the, the first beat. It's going to be... Get up, everybody. Get up. Okay.
just for music. <clears throat> and sit down pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you who are able, get up. In, I don't, well, we're not in a technically a church building, but we're having church. <laughs> so, that means any form of praise that God gives to you, if that is in your body, I'm from Jamaica, so I don't have much control over these hips. <laughs> it's just the way it is. I, I try at church, and it, I still fail every time. My body sings with me. Whatever part of you experiences joy, and whatever expression you have for joy, it is acceptable to the one who gave it to you. Amen. Amen. And you use it to glorify him. So, we are going to stomp, dance, move, whatever, we, whatever form of praise is acceptable to you, we are going to do it. Because guess what? If you think that they did not dance, you have something coming. It was as natural as breathing. All right, so enjoy it. Uh, in your own lives and 
you can identify with going through your own personal struggles for a reason. You can relate to somebody who did something so great, uh, made such a huge sacrifice. I can go through this little stuff that I'm going through. Because at Calvary, he paid for people who didn't even deserve it. You know, I know I don't deserve it. You know, um, but for somebody to do something like that for you, it's pretty amazing.
that we can always practice. This is some way that we can pay, pay tribute to her. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you very much. For the
as always, thank you. What happens, what works at the community center works only because you folks show up. So please, one last time, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> We'll do the next thing, because we always, Brian, who's our president, board president, and I have this conversation. Every time we do something, we celebrate it, but we say that's the th that's not the thing, that's the next thing. Next thing, a week from yesterday, talk to Ms. Tanner and Bat. It's our all our senior club is having its oldies. I don't like oldies. I like really good. <laughs> really good. Really good, dance. good good music and dance. So fundraiser for our senior club, Ms. Scanner can talk to you about the specifics. Once again, thank you so much for being here. <laughs>